Thank you. Good morning. My name is Brian. I'm going to be talking about um, reorganizations and forks in the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so if you've forgotten, I just said my name. It's Brian. Um, okay, but first, um, before I get going, um, I want to define what a reorganization is and what a fork is. Uh, you might have heard that the Bitcoin blockchain is a permanent data structure that records everything for all time, and that's actually somewhat false. Instead, actually, the Bitcoin blockchain can be modified and changed, and some of these changes are called reorgs, and some of these changes are called forks. Um, in general, if a change has something to do with a change in the rules in the Bitcoin blockchain, then it's called a fork. And then a reorganization is um, usually does not require anything to do with a rule change. Some, some reorganizations are actually completely valid under the Bitcoin blockchain rules. Uh, before I get into that further, though, um, I'm going to talk about some motivation for why this is interesting at all in the case of Bitcoin. And that's because Bitcoin transactions actually require something called a confirmation, which is basically the idea of Bitcoin transactions getting buried in the blockchain. And as they get buried further by further work and further blocks being built on top of them, these transactions are considered confirmed. So um, early on in the few years ago for Bitcoin, it was widely believed incorrectly that, well, I mean, it was, it was believed by other people, not really by developers, that you can actually have zero confirmation transactions. That's actually false. You need to wait for transactions to confirm. And there's a special case in, in the case of like a Lightning Network and other similar technologies where you can actually have zero confirmation transactions, but that will be explored later today um, by um, probably Taj. If he's here, all right, I don't see Taj. So maybe it won't be, but. Um. So anyway, uh, to determine how long to wait for these confirmations, there's uh, some calculations that you can do that I'll be describing later in this presentation. Um, this is from uh, the Bitcoin white paper, section 11. Um, I'm actually not gonna recite it from memory. I know it says recite from memory, but I won't do that. Uh, the popular belief or the popular recommendation is to wait for six confirmations and after that point you consider the transaction to be completely confirmed and irrevocable. Um, however, that's not really true either, but there does need to be a point where the community in general says if there's a problem in the Bitcoin blockchain that goes beyond six blocks that are removed from the blockchain, then uh, you know, we, we consider that a, a catastrophe of some kind. Um, so, so why is this interesting? Well, I mean, the reason why there is a confirmation at all is because, um, first of all, if, if a transaction is not confirmed, then theoretically it can be spent any number of times, um, and that degrades the value of the currencies. So one of the properties of money is that if you spend it, it stays spent. You can't just redo it or something, and there needs to be a record of all these transactions. If you do not have the confirmations, then... Uh, the transaction hasn't actually been spent and the receiver has not received their money. Uh, in certain situations, which I'll explore in a moment, um, or a bit more than a moment, uh, there are something called the reorganizations, which is a change in the actual tip or first few blocks in the blockchain. And in, in those situations where these replacement blocks come into existence, in, in certain cases, the transactions that were in the previous set of blocks are not going to be included in the new set of blocks. No, I'll show, I'll show that. Uh, this is section 11 of the Bitcoin white paper. Um, using a pause on process, you can calculate, or, or he calls it a gambler runes, gambler's rune problem. And basically it's just the probability of an attacker being able to win out against the Bitcoin network by devoting some amount of energy. And it's this probabilistic calculation um, to determine uh, the rate of success of this attack against the, the Bitcoin network, which is that you're racing all the other miners to create your own blocks that have a special set of transactions, perhaps including or excluding one that the other miners aren't including or don't know about or, or something like that. Maybe you wanna censor a transaction, maybe you wanna do a double spending attack where you previously sent money and a merchant gave you a digital coupon download code and now you want your money back, um, things like that. Uh, this is also section 11. Um, uh, and so on and so forth. I'm not going to go through the math, but um, 
Uh, there's, in fact, implementation of it, and you can go and type into a form online, and there's there's fields, and you know if you have 40% of the hash rate, and you're trying to, um, and and if uh, sorry, if your attacker has 40% of the hash rate, and you're waiting six confirmations, and then you can calculate the attack success probability as in this case 50% probability of you winning and being able to. Uh, uh, get a different block into the blockchain instead of the one that was previously confirmed, partially confirmed. So in, in the event that there is a change in the tip of the blockchain, that can be considered a reorganization. And there is a case where it is benign, uh, somewhat benign, um, such as um, when you have an orphan block where a miner perhaps finds a block, but then a moment later, Another miner found a block at the same height, and thus your block is, is not, it's not going to be included in the blockchain for whatever reason. Perhaps the other miner published theirs first or had a faster connection than yours or something, or had better connectivity than in network. And that's, that's a, used to be somewhat frequent uh, situation, although it's less frequent today in Bitcoin, uh, in part due to network improvements from like uh, Blue Mat's work and other things. Um, so anyway, I mean, this diagram is... Uh, it's a chain of blocks. Um, ignore the coloring here. I mean, other than the black, the black is indicative of a single chain. And then these other colors you can ignore. But um, essentially, uh, it's quite simple. I mean, at, at this point in time, you know, when you get your next block, um, if, if, uh, if the blockchain that your node had was up to this point, um, and then later you get three blocks here, that have more work and are a better fit according to the rules of the Bitcoin blockchain. I mean, if you're on this node now, this is considered to have been a reorganization event switching to these blocks. Uh, so again, like I said, I mean, for a reorganization, it's when the tip of the blockchain is replaced with different blocks. Uh, one way to think about this is a rollback. So like rolling back version history, very similar. Uh, the most common type of reorg is, is what I would call a shallow reorg. That's not standard terminology. It's just what I call it. Uh, the, the one to be really concerned about is the deep reorgs, where uh, these can be pretty deep and deeper than you think. And there's a chance of these happening, and uh, you just need to be careful. And I'll explain the implications of those. So one way to think about this, though, is that a reorg in the case of like an orphan block is really generally not considered adversarial because that's just something that occurs perhaps due to the network topology of the Bitcoin network or other things that people didn't really intend. But um, technically, a, a adversarial entity or attacker could purchase or rent Bitcoin hash rate and create blocks of this structure that they prefer and uh, this has a monetary cost that you can go and calculate, and it's really not as high as you might think. Um, so if you're running a centralized service where you're accepting deposits and you have withdrawals, as an example, um, miners can, or, or even non-miners can rent mining hash rate and uh, do certain attacks. Yes, shout it. Oh yeah, there, there was an exchange that had an attack against it. Oh, interesting. Right. So anyway, this is this is common. It does happen. There are recent cases that we can discuss. Um, so anyway, uh, be prepared for that. And there there are certain things you can do to um, help mitigate against this if you're like running a service or writing a Bitcoin related protocol or something, which I'll explain in a bit. Uh, so. If you're writing a wallet or a node or some centralized service, perhaps, or even a, a client for a Bitcoin-related protocol, you have to be able to handle these reorgs that occur. Um, now, the, the uh, easiest way to go and do this, actually, is to assume that reorgs do not exist past a certain confirmation depth. And you can just say, OK, after 200 blocks, I'm going to assume that there will never be a reorg that affects this. The problem with this, though, is that users are going to be really upset at you because you're forcing them to wait 200 blocks. So you generally have to implement things to handle reorgs um, in a more timely way so that you can just have users wait 
uh, less than forever. Um, so the way to do this, though, is that, um, let's see, do I, okay. Um, so what you want to do is you want to get a list of all the blocks that um, are, are in difference between your local copy and the um, Bitcoin blockchain current best blockchain. And then you want to um, get those, those list of blocks and then within those blocks you want to determine whether there are any transactions in those blocks that have been removed that had that were related to your protocol or your node or your user or whatever it is. And then you want to look at the new blocks and then you want to determine whether any of those transactions have been removed. Are they missing? Are they mutated in some way? Are they changed? For example, by mutation, I mean um, TXID malleability is one example, but another example is that, which includes a TXID malleability, but uh, it's like if someone did um, um, fee bumping, like replace by fee, where they added an input or something, technically that's a different transaction, even though it might still have the same general structure, the transaction will include other inputs, might include other outputs, all sorts of stuff. So you need to be able to handle those cases where in a, the event of a reorg, the transactions actually look different and you have to go and update what you previously thought was a confirmed transaction is now completely different and you have to update your internal database and all sorts of other stuff. Uh, one way to think about this is that is, uh, it's very similar to syncing a node on the blockchain. And if, you were, if your node is offline for a long time or something, then you have this problem of, okay, you have a Bitcoin blockchain that had a block from six months ago, and now you have to do six months of catch up. How does your node know what to download? So um, I call this uh, find the most recent common block. And uh, basically you can do, um, what I like to do is, uh, I call it a multi-point binary search. I don't know if that's actually what it should be called. But um, I mean, you could in theory just do a binary search and um, uh, you know, you can ask over RPC or the peer-to-peer -peer protocol or something and just keep getting a block and keep going back in the block height integer until you get to a point where you have the same block hash. Um, the reason why I do multi-point is because it's a bit faster. If you can sample multiple points at the same time, then you can just uh, get there a bit faster with uh, less requests. I mean, what you want to avoid doing is like iteratively pulling down each and every block until you find the um, most recent common block. Instead, you just want to do the block hashes or something really fast. And unfortunately, the software, all the software that I've seen is uh, very slow uh, for getting like the list of all the block hashes. So that's why you want to do like this sampling approach or something. So if you're writing an application, what do you do to ensure that you've done reorg handling correctly? Well, I mean, obviously the answer is testing. And there's different area, different levels of testing that you can do. Uh, one is, um, and I actually expect that most people are not doing this, but you can do unit testing without anything related to Bitcoin, really. Uh, by which I mean, um, uh, you can just have your maps or dictionaries have a list of blocks and you know you map to a list of transactions or something. And then you can say, well, that's my, my simulation of a blockchain. And then you can test your, your code against that. And then perhaps one level more um, complex than that is have a Bitcoin library in the programming language of your choice, and maybe with like mocks for RPC or something, and have like a mocked implementation of a Bitcoin node. And then you can actually do real testing against a Bitcoin node using RegTest. And then if you're even more daring, you can use TestNet, which is a bit more volatile and won't behave in the way that you hope it will, but you should do it anyway. And then ideally, um, especially if you have like a company running a centralized service, um, I've always highly encouraged customers to test against testnet with the company's integration. Uh, so that like, like if I had it my way, I would actually insist that every customer should always do a test deposit on testnet before they are allowed to deposit for real on Bitcoin mainnet. Uh, because I don't wanna be responsible in the event that they do a, a real deposit on mainnet without testing first and you know for whatever reason their wallet is broken or they're doing something stupid. Um, but anyway, um, this was supposed to be about reworks. Um, so how do you mitigate some of the problems that can occur in reorgs? Like in the event of, uh, for example, the, the example that I was given earlier was an exchange that had a, I, think, I guess it was a 51% attack against uh, one of the altcoins that the exchange listed. And um, 
might not even be fair to call it 51% attack. I mean, it was just some sort of hash rate attack that caused a reorg. And the exchange had credited a, a user on the exchange for a deposit. And uh, then they were able to make a withdrawal on another currency because they traded on the exchange or something. And um, uh, that, that's obviously bad because to, due to the reorg, the adversary was able to get back their original coins that they had deposited. So they, it's double spending. They got their original coins back, but also they got a withdrawal in another currency. Um, that same attack, though, can also happen in the case on the same cryptocurrency. So you do that attack, and then the exchange gives you a withdrawal back in the original same cryptocurrency. But they don't give you a withdrawal for the coins that you had deposited because perhaps your wallet is broken. So instead they give you, it, well, by broken I mean poorly designed. Instead they give you a cryptocurrency withdrawal in the same cryptocurrency but different coins. And that's really broken because now you have the original coins that you reorged out, but then also a withdrawal transaction that is still valid after the reorg uh, for the same cryptocurrency. So now you have your double your money. So how do you how do you go and prevent this? Well, the way I would describe it is that you need to have something like I call taint, which is that you you want to taint all of the withdrawals with all of the recent deposits. And the reason why this works is that if you taint all the withdrawals with all the recent deposits, in the event that the deposits disappear due to a reorganization or some sort of hash rate attack, then the withdrawals are automatically invalidated because the deposits no longer existed. So the Bitcoin transaction that that gave the withdrawal you have to taint with the deposits. If the deposits don't exist, that transaction is no longer valid, and they won't be able to steal your money. Um, any questions about that? That one might be a bit weird. Sure. Yeah, um, tainting withdrawals with deposits might be difficult if your deposit wallets are cold. So I'm wondering if there's any way that you can think of to taint withdraws with deposits on like a real-time basis when you need to get like five guys into a bunker to sign whatever it is that they need to sign. Well, un unfortunately, um, hot wallets have these problems in general, or, or hot wallets and gold wallets. Like if, you're, if your requirement is that you have timely access to your Bitcoin, you can sign immediately or instantly or something, then you're going to have a lot of security problems in general. Yeah. So uh, yeah. I, I don't know a good solution for that. Okay, thanks. All right, moving on from reorganizations to um, forks, the other part of this talk. Uh, forks are similar to reorgs, I guess, but, but in general, forks are... Forks are something that occur in the Bitcoin blockchain when there are different rules at play, where you have different software that has been deployed or different rules have been implemented. Um, in general, a soft fork is where you have a, um, it's actually a kind of disputed, uh, backwards or forwards compatible change to the consensus rules, meaning that um, the new rules are actually um, a restriction of the previous rules. So by all the nodes that were previously deployed in the network, the new rules and the new data or the new activity or behavior is still valid according to the old rules. But, but the new rules that are added uh, under a soft fork just restrict that behavior to a, to a subset of the previously allowed behavior. And uh, by, by this is useful for, for things like um, um, just restricting, restricting the set of possibilities that you can do um, and then enforcing some new rules that you all agree to. Now, the other fork type is a hard fork. And this is actually an oversimplification, but hard forks are generally incompatible changes that nodes um, would reject because they're incompatible with the rules that were previously deployed on all of those nodes that were operating. Um, like the slide says, both have uh, reorganization-related considerations. Um, something to consider is that if you're deploying new software with new rules to the Bitcoin network, um, there are situations where not all of the nodes have upgraded. And furthermore, not all of the miners may have upgraded. And you can get into these um, um, successive rollbacks that keep occurring multiple times because some nodes are upgraded, some aren't. And they keep bouncing around data to each other. And um, uh, this is something that you have to be aware of. And when you're designing forks of any kind, you have to um, keep that in mind. Um, for example, a fork event, and 
if you have poorly defined your soft fork or hard fork activation trigger could occur multiple times and ideally you want an upgrade or activation to only occur once. And then furthermore, if you have poorly designed your upgrade or, or the features or you haven't considered all the consensus related changes, um, there, there might actually be more chained forks than you expected. Um, hopefully we'll have a talk about that later today actually. Um, that's actually, gets really into the weeds. Um, I don't really want to talk about it, but someone else might. Uh, like in, in particular, the, re the reason why that occurs is um, uh, when we talk about the Bitcoin blockchain and like consensus code, there, there is a section of code in the Bitcoin client that um, has to be very carefully handled because if there are discrepancies between two nodes and how they interpret this consensus critical code, then they will not agree on valid blocks in the blockchain. And then they'll start rejecting blocks and then everyone will be using different money. And ideally we want everyone to be using Bitcoin and like one set of rules for Bitcoin. Um, so this is my hard fork diagram. It's very similar to the reorg diagram. Uh, in this one, the colors do matter. Um, uh, you, you can consider, for example, this, this um, edge to be a hard fork activation. And the nodes that are purple nodes, hard fork purple nodes, for example, um, in certain situations where a hard fork is correctly specified, will not actually switch to these other blocks that are being produced, even if they have more hash rate. Um, hard forks can be designed such that uh, these nodes will forever reject that sort of data, or, or vice versa, the other way around. There are many kinds of hard forks. Um, I'm not going to describe all of them, but um, um, they, can get, they can get pretty interesting. Um, like, um, it's actually kind of adversarial almost. Um, an extension block is an interesting one to focus on, which is where you can have a commitment to extra data inside of the block, and then this extra data also has to be validated. This was actually proposed as a block size increase mechanism. Um, Segwit was a soft fork, and uh, that one was interesting. Um, basically, um, it was a restriction on a rule that was previously that uh, certain transaction types um, could be um, spent by anyone, and then with SegWit, that was a restriction on those rules such that um, it could only be spent based off of the witness data. Um, and, and by that way, with some extra accounting um, methods, uh, you can do weight and sig op limit changes and so on, and you got an effective block size increase out of SegWit. So there's a further topic related to forks that you have to consider called replay protection. In the event that someone has created a fork, um, and this, this is quite a consternation for companies and wallets and all sorts of stuff, um, because if, if someone forks Bitcoin and makes some other version of Bitcoin that they call like Bitcoin 2 or something, and, and if they make basically no changes other than the fact that Bitcoin 2 nodes reject Bitcoin blocks and they have like some other blocks that somehow get created. Um, and, and that's like the only change. The problem is that Bitcoin transactions will be possible to be replayed onto the Bitcoin 2 blockchain. And this is kind of bad because it causes mayhem and chaos and confusion for users. Because if they make a Bitcoin transaction, they're expecting, well, I only authorized a Bitcoin transaction. But a fork might actually say all Bitcoin transactions are valid on our chain as well. And now companies have to deal with this and they're like, well, you sent me Bitcoin too, but I asked you to deposit Bitcoin and stuff like that. Um, so there's some methods um, for doing replay protection when a, when a fork implementation has not added replay protection on their side. Um, the general recommendations, there's a replace by fee method that has been explained online and also a lock time method. And the replace by fee method is that um, if you want to make sure that your coins are are different, that no transaction that you make can be replayed on both blockchains. You actually intentionally make a transaction that can be replayed on both blockchains. Um, and then on one of them, you, you hopefully get a confirmation before the other. And then the other one you replace um, by using replace by fee or something. And now this can actually um, uh, not work so well if the other blockchain might have um, 
uh, disabled replace by fee or some or that our nodes have disabled replace by fee. It's not a consensus rule, but their nodes on their network might not uh, allow that. Um, um, although I think I think you only need it for at least one blockchain in this in this scenario where you have like a two blockchain thing going on, two blockchain fork. Um, and then there's like this further problem in cases where replay protection has not been implemented, which is where if you receive a deposit from a user, you might be receiving a deposit on both blockchains at the same time, even if you only have infrastructure to handle Bitcoin. So anyway, um, forks without replay protection, we don't we don't like those. Uh, we prefer forks with replay protection. Um, two ways to think about it, actually. Um, there's been like cases of opt-in replay protection and opt-out replay protection. In general, we should always prefer cases where we ask users to opt out of replay protection. Opt-in replay protection basically means that users are vulnerable by default, and that's a vulnerability that should be avoided. Um, with opt-in replay protection, users would have to know about all the forks, but I mean, there's been 80 forks of Bitcoin. I don't have time to keep track of those. That's not That shouldn't be my problem. Um, anyway, there's been a lot of proposals for how to do replay protection. Usually it's like to set a bit or something in the SIG hash flag, which makes the transaction signature invalid on the Bitcoin blockchain, but valid on the alternative blockchains. Uh, there's been some good work by Johnson Lau and Luke too uh, for, um, Bitcoin hard forks at that URL, and their research has been aggreg aggregated there. Um, just to drive the point home uh, with replay of transactions across blockchains, um, in a situation with multiple forks, certain transactions, it is possible for transactions to replay across multiple forks simultaneously. So um, this can cause a lot of mayhem and chaos and it gets really difficult to track where are all the transactions, who's sending me money, who's not, um, why is this occurring, how do we stop it, things like that. Just has to be, you have to be really careful around forks. Um, so one interesting method, um, and, and I'm not, I don't recommend it, but I'm gonna describe it anyway, is that you could, you could say, well, if there's multiple forks um, and you're, maybe you're a business, you're accepting deposits or something, um, you could say, well, I don't want to handle any of this fork stuff. So instead, I'm going to demand that my users only deposit pre-fork coins from all of the blockchains, from all of the forks, and then uh, those are the only coins that I'll accept as deposits. And then you consider it the, the unison of all the blockchains as, the, as a valid Bitcoin. Um, this is... Kind of stupid. I don't recommend it, but I mean, it's certainly one way to do it because then you could just say, well, either it works, either my transactions work on all the blockchains or, or none of them or something. Uh, but I mean, generally, I mean, most people only care about the Bitcoin blockchain. That's where Bitcoin is. All these other chains, you know, that's not Bitcoin. So, um, one one further idea, real quick, is that um, uh, related to tainting, is that another another method of tainting to uh, protect against replays is uh, after the split or a fork in the blockchain, you can actually use um, post-fork minted coins in transactions, and those coins will be invalid on the other side of the, of the fork. So that's, that's another way of doing replay protection. Um, and, and that's all I have. Thank you. Uh, questions about forks, reorganizations, confirmations, why Bitcoin, how Bitcoin, any sort of questions like that, sure. Uh, thank you for, talk, for your talk. I think uh, forks and reorgs are very important and many people need to know about them. Um, I'm just wondering is that, is there a technical way, and this is what I was thinking with all the hard fork coins of Bitcoin, it, would there be like a, a, a possible or like a standardizable way to make it so that you would hard fork from Bitcoin, but like, I don't know, you would be able to blacklist like certain coins or, or, or somehow get it to be like, okay, we're going to make a new fork of Bitcoin, but these, these coins are not, you know, um, usable on the new fork, I guess. Um, so anyone who creates a fork, the fork designers can choose to do that, yeah. and they can make a blacklist. Okay. But but users who are not privy to the design of that fork cannot do that, cannot choose that. 
Yeah. Um, so actually, uh, Kali had made, um, no, it wasn't Kali. Who was it? Um, well, anyway, someone made a, um, a uh, hard fork generator. And the idea oh, was yeah. to automatically generate hard forks. And um, uh, presumably, this would reduce the value of, of all these hard forks or whatever to demonstrate that the value of these is zero. Unfortunately, um, I, don't, I don't know if that's actually occurred yet. Uh, I think people just said, oh, thanks. And then like they pay for it or something. Um, yeah. <laughs> so that that's not going as planned. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, also, I would be interested. Uh, it's not exactly technical, but this is something that comes up, especially among exchanges. Um, what do you think, as far as the ownership of the forked coins for people who are are giving their bitcoins to exchanges? So, like, if they have a bitcoin on an exchange and then a hard fork happens and no one hears it, do they now have the new? Hard fork coin, is that theirs or what? So uh, that's a really interesting question. My, my personal opinion is that companies should have no requirement to deal with those at all. Yes. Um, that's a huge integration cost. That's like, this is these other people creating these forks arbitrarily out of thin air and then saying that anyone with these private keys or whatever own the, these other coins or whatever. It's just a, yeah, it's a huge mess and it's just, it's just a complete waste of time and we should be focused on Bitcoin. Yeah, thanks. All right, thank you.